This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is an award-winning actor, author, and businessman who is perhaps best known for his portrayal of the closeted art director Sal Romano on the mega-hit TV series Mad Men, for which he won two Screen Actors Guild Awards, along with his fellow castmates for outstanding performance by an ensemble in a drama series. But he's done much, much more than that. On Broadway, he's appeared in many shows, including Cats, Starlight Express, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, Beauty and the Beast, Sunset Boulevard, Saturday Night Fever, Susicle, The Scarlet Pimpernel, and La Cage au Folle. On the big screen, you've seen him in Jeffrey, Funny People, Brawler, B-Side, 12 Years a Slave, Parkland, The Runner, LBJ, American Reject, High Tide, Easy Does It, and many more movies. He also starred in the highly acclaimed short film, The Palooka, for which he earned two Best Actor Award nominations from the Massachusetts Independent Film Festival. And on TV, besides his memorable performance in Mad Men, he's appeared in dozens of shows, including Ghost Whisperer, Ugly Betty, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, NCIS, Scream, the TV series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, East Siders, and many more. He's also written three best-selling books, a fascinating memoir entitled She Ain't Heavy, She's My Mother, Big Easy Style, Creating Rooms You Love to Live In, which is a beautiful book about interior design and home decor, and Ponchar Train Beach, A Family Affair, about the famous New Orleans amusement park founded by his grandfather. And if all of that weren't enough, our guest and his husband, Tom, are the owners of an extremely popular home furnishings and gift shop in New Orleans called Hazelnut. Our guest is passionate in his support of charities and civic organizations in New York City and New Orleans, especially his more than 30-year relationship with Broadway Cares, Equity Fights, AIDS. He's a recipient of the Isidore Newman Distinguished Alumnus Award, and on April the 13th, he will be the honoree at the New Orleans Film Society Gala. I am delighted to welcome Brian Batt to our show. Brian, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I want to start by asking you about your mom, Gail, whom you've immortalized in your book, She Ain't Heavy, She's My Mother. You've given us the impression of a big-hearted, strong-willed, resilient, authentic Southern belle who taught you everything you needed to know about what's important in life. What made you decide to write the book? You know, the impetus was, uh, I, the truth, I, we were in, on Fire Island uh, with Paul Rudnick and his partner, and B.D. Wong and Richie Jackson were together at the time. We went over to their house for dinner, and we started telling stories of our childhood. And I told the story about going to the child psychologist and drawing you know, Liza Minnelli on my, on my form, and they all laughed so much. And basically, they said, you have to write these stories. So eventually, I started writing them. And it, it's cheaper than therapy uh, <laughs> to, uh, to write your stories. So I started writing them while I was in Beauty and the Beast. And I let my friend Beth Fowler, who sat next to me, read them. And she said, these are great. And said, uh, you know, uh, Charles Bush's partner is... Uh, a, 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 a literary agent. So I sent them to him and he liked them, but he said, you know, short stories, a hard sell, you know, keep on working on it. And then when Mad Men hit, he said, I think I can get you a book deal. So that's how that came about. And then I had to finish them. But I wanted to always pay some kind of homage or tribute to my mom because I knew at an early age, I lucked out. I, I won the lottery when it came to mom's. Uh, I just knew that I was loved unconditionally and supported in a, in a really positive way. Per now, no one's perfect, but I really lucked out. And she is beloved in this city, too. She was became an you know, iconic member of, of society here in New Orleans, very giving of her time and, 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 and just very, um, you know, very beloved person. And I, I just wanted to pay some tribute to her, and it, and it just turned out to be a funny, 
loving book. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your mom with all of us. Now, I want to ask you about Starlight Express. You played Uh Rocky the Boxcar. How in the world did you learn how to dance and do acrobatics on roller skates? Well, I, I always loved to skate growing up. And when I heard it was coming to Broadway, I, I just wanted to be on Broadway so badly. I taught myself how to do cartwheels and all these other things that I could do on, on my feet, you know, regularly without skates. So I auditioned and I got called back and called back. And I think I just willed myself not to fall down. And it was, it was, it was grueling. It was the most exhausting, physically exhausting show ever. And in the middle of my performance, about six months or seven months into my run, I tore the cartilage in my knee in the middle of my number and had to like drag myself over to the side of the stage and finish the number. Had had the constructive reconstructive surgery and then went back into the show. You are really so talk about the show must go on. And then you played Lumiere in Beauty and the Beast. And not yeah. only did your costume look really cumbersome, but how did you manage not to set yourself on fire? Well, you know, it was very funny. They, you have these, these butane packs on the back of your costume, then tubes down your arms, and there's a little switch to st- light the butane, and then a little click thing, like, you know, and those little lighter sticks to ignite the flame. And that was learning how to do that was just as complicated as choreography or learning the lines. That was choreographed just as much to let it go, click, turn it off with you know, the way my hands move. But I was very lucky. The only thing they did inform me that everything on the set was fire retardant except my wig. Unreal, unreal the roles you've had. You were a standby for Gary Beach on Broadway in La Cage au Fall. And if I remember correctly, Brian, you actually got to appear a number of times as Albin alongside Robert Goulet. Yes. What was he like to work with? He was very kind, very giving, a lovely gentleman. And that voice, I mean, it was just, you know, when he sang Song on the Sand, I just, you know, I started to tear up every night. It was so beautiful. I, I rehearsed with him before he went into the show. So we had a rapport before. So when I got to go on with him, it was it was special. He was a very kind, giving, giving actor and gentleman. That's so nice to hear. He certainly presented that way. When I look at your Broadway career, Brian, with perhaps the exception of Saturday Night Fever, every show you were in had original music with songs that were written for that show. What do you think of all the jukebox musicals out there now? You know, I I hope it's just a trend, but you know, Saturday Night Fever was not, I did that in 1999 and we weren't the first of the jukebox musicals. I think Mama Mia and there might have been another one around there. But sometimes they can be wonderful and then sometimes not so wonderful. Some of the ones you'd think that would be big hits were big flops. The one using the Beatles music, the John Lennon music was didn't didn't work. The Beach Boys, you would think, would have been great. So it just boils down to the, the story is the thing. You know, if, if the music can legitimately support the story that you're trying to tell, and that story is a story that's worthwhile telling, then it's great. Like I recently, I just love the musical Beautiful. I thought it was great. And um, Ain't Too Proud, totally. I thought they were interesting stories about the writer themselves or the group themselves. That's what I thought was what worked for me with those musicals. I think you would have been great in Jersey Boys. <laughs> well, I was a little long in the tooth at the time, but you know. You've had a very impressive and extensive career on stage, as well as in the movies and on TV. Do you have a preference as between doing live theater versus acting in front of the camera? I should have been asked that so many times. And I, and I always want to say I love them both. And it's very true. It's, but, you know, the, my first love is the theater, of course. But I, I also really love and grew to respect working on film and television. One of the one of the perks is that you usually have your weekends off. So you can have pretty much a normal life. You know, with a the theater, you do a Friday night, two Saturday, and a Sunday. 
No one gets married on a Monday night, you know, which is usually a theater day off. You know, nothing really exciting happens on a Monday. So that's, you know, that's one aspect. You know, there's nothing like the live audience. There's nothing like it. But with theater, you have the luxury of rehearsal, a long, you know, pretty much a rehearsal period. And then you have a preview period where you try it and hone it. And your job is to recreate the performance like it's the first time you're doing it every night. That's, you know, the crap. That's what you try to do. In, in film and television, there's very little rehearsal. For the most part, very little. And you have to be able and be able to try everything you want to try and and, and 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 be on at that moment because you know sometimes i remember a film i did not too long ago they were running very late very behind and i had a big big death scene and i only got one take which you know it's kind of it was kind of hard to swallow because like come on let's do it again they go we really don't have time i said and the director's like but we got it i'm like how do i how can i be sure you know, so you're not. And also with film, you're at the mercy of the editors and everyone else, everyone else's uh, manipulation of your performance, where on stage, it's just you. So it, they're, they're two completely different genres, but also uh, they all come from the same place. So I, I do love them both. Well, the one thing about television in particular is that in one performance, you can reach more people than you could reach yeah. in an entire run of a Broadway oh, show. Totally. And some careers, you know, more people have seen Mad Men than I think have seen me in, on stage, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I wouldn't doubt it. Well, that takes me to Mad Men. Thank you for the segue. <laughs> it, it is widely considered to be one of the top 10 TV shows of all time. Brian, when you were filming the very first season of the show, when the audience wasn't really that big, were you and your fellow castmates worried that maybe the public just would not get it in terms of understanding what the show was trying to achieve? We knew early on that it was something special. Just by the way that the scripts were so great, the, the, we, they, took, they, they took such time and we, on the detail, and it was just a joy to go to work. And we knew early on, after we saw the pilot, we were like, oh, this is what it is. This is great. The fact that we were on AMC, it was their first foray into, you know, uh, episodic television of that quality. And, you know, the, our first season, you know, our numbers were not that great. But it was the press. It was the media. It was word of mouth that basically saying, this is great, you must see it. And we were like the little engine that could. Within that first season, we were nominated for everything, you know? And and then, then it was just a snowball effect. It was just thrilling to see, you know, see what happened with it and uh, just to be part of that. And, and, you know, Matt Weiner is a genius and his he created this wonderful character of Salvatore and entrusted him to me and the other writers that when you're given scripts like that, it is such a gift because all we really had to do was show up and, and just be truthful and say, say the script as written. We didn't, there was no changing one word or anything. There was no need to. And, and it was almost Shakespearean in a way that you didn't have to worry about, you know, it's right there. And we knew that we were going to, they were never going to let us look bad. Well, you mentioned AMC. I think, now this is just my opinion, but if the show had been on network television instead of AMC, okay. I think it would have been canceled. We know what happened. Like right after our first season was the strike. It was the first strike. And some of the networks were looking for product. Now this is before there were, you know, two million networks and stations, you know, having such content. So they were looking to different uh, other networks to show to show content. And I, we were in the, we were almost going to be on NBC. This is what I was told on NBC and run the season, which would have been great because, you know, uh, you know, NBC, ABC, you know, that, that, that yeah. different kind of money than basic cable and network money is very, very different. 
but they decided to go with Dexter. And you, and and the reason cited was because of the smoking and the drinking on the, on the thing. So serial killing is okay, but not smoking and drinking. Why does that tell you? Wow. Hello. You know, by the time Mad Men came along in your life, Brian, after everything else you had achieved, were you able to enjoy and appreciate the phenomenal success of being in a big hit show? Yes, I really was. I remember when I was doing the original company of Sunset Boulevard. And at the same time, the same week, I was on for the male lead, Joe Gillis, opposite Betty Buckley. And that same week, the film of Jeffrey opened up. So it was these two great things going on at the same time. And a good friend in the business came to see me backstage and said, look, just enjoy this. This this kind, this doesn't happen all the time, all this at once. And I was younger, of course, and I was just trying to force, you know, trying to trying to make something happen out of this and and rather than just enjoy it. So when Mad Men started to click, I went, all right, remember that advice. Sit back and just enjoy the wave and you know the roller coaster. And um, Tommy Toon told me that once too, enjoy the wave. And I did. And it's been, it's it, it's so much better because it, you're not trying to force or make something happen. Not that I didn't, you know, try to continue to work as an actor or try to parlay this into something, but it wasn't my sole intent. I just loved the work and, and doing it. How difficult was it for you I mean, you're an out proud gay man and you had to portray a closeted gay man. Was that hard? Well, you know, for a part of my life, I was closeted. So, you know, I uh, I just drew on that memory. And, you know, also when I first started acting, you know, I was told by some agents, you know, you don't match your look. You look like, you know, a tough straight guy. So I had to put on this, you know, Tough straight guy, put the voice down, walk in. And I realized at a certain age, I was like, you know, I'm sick of pretending. I cannot pretend in real life. I have to pretend on stage and in my career. I cannot pretend to be someone I'm not. And and that was a great moment. And I luck, luckily, you know, I met my now husband, Tom. We've been together 35 years, then married 10. And it, it really, and that was all in the height of the AIDS crisis. So everything really worked out, you know. Well, thank God for that. And it sure makes working and all the disappointments and all of the unpredictability of show business easier when you have someone who loves you by your side, don't you think? True, true. So true. So has being openly gay as an actor in Hollywood had a good impact on your career or not? I, I really can't tell. Right after I did the film of Jeffrey, all I could get seen for were just these stereotypical uh, joke, jokes of roles, you know, that the, the joke, oh, they're gay, ha ha. You know, and I never thought someone, you know, so someone who's black, that's not the joke. Someone who's Hispanic, that's not the joke. If you have anything, if you're different in any way from, you know, the norm or, you know, white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, straight guy, you know, that's that's the punchline. And I really didn't want to play that. I didn't really want to. That's why I loved playing Salvatore because he was a complex character. And he had, it was it was a truthful portrayal and and representation of what gay men had to go through at that time and it's still happening there are these men that think they have to get married to women and even though they are attracted and you know have sex with a man it's like no yeah it's 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 such a shame and the guilt attached and all of the issues uh People just live and let live and be your true self. It's 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 so much easier. Well, many people in the industry have told me that while public attitudes about being gay have definitely improved, there is still something of a celluloid closet in Hollywood. Yeah, I'm it sure. It can be extremely sure. career limiting for gay actors to come out publicly 
Don't you think that's still true? Yeah, I mean, I think if, you know, I think we're getting better, but I think it's going to take even longer. You know, I think there, there's some like Neil Patrick Harris and, uh, you know, Matt Bomer and, and some of these young heartthrobs that just happen to be gay, you know, are still also playing straight roles, which I really love to see. Because when it boils down to it, we're actors. And, you know, I think a gay man can play a straight man and a straight man, God knows, have always played the gay men too. So I think it's possibly a double-edged sword. But yes, I do think so. I think when, when, there, when you're talking millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars on the line and, you know, if they don't think they could sell, you know, uh, a, a bisexual or gay character or actor playing a heterosexual character, I don't know. I'm so removed from that, <laughs> you know? I don't go to the movies thinking, oh, they're going to fall in love with me as like, you know, people used to go, you know, thinking Clark Cable's is going to, you know, going to love, you know, I have a chance, right? You know, so I I, I look at it, I, I see everything from, from the industry standpoint, you know? But also if a movie or play or musical can take me out or transport me or make me just take me into the story so fully that then that's my litmus test of a great 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 uh, uh theater experience or film experience and that's what it should be now your yeah. character in Mad Men's Sal Romano was written out of the show after three seasons because he got fired from the ad agency did that upset you yes <laughs> in a word yes yeah, it was devastating. I, I really was devastated. And I think so was a lot of the cast. They really, we, we really were a tight knit group. But that just happens. That That is part of fact. I don't think Sal was supposed to be there for the entire first three seasons. I think he might have, you know, in the, in the projectory, he might have been gone earlier. However, you know, in the third or fourth seasons of, of most all episodic television, there's a big shakeup. And as you notice, other people kept on going. There were a few that, you know, some remained, a lot remained. But, you know, and then Matt came from the, uh, the writers really, a lot of them came from the uh, Sopranos. And um, not that I people get killed, but when someone leaves, it's kind of got to hurt a little bit, you know. I, t still to this day, I get, what happened to Sal? We love Sal. He was our favorite character with such a great storyline. What happened? Still today, I get that. So, you know, kind of, it kind of had an impact. So I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Oh, absolutely. I was one of those people. I did not enjoy seeing Sal go, I'll tell you. And then 14 years after doing Mad Men, you starred in an off-Broadway play called Pay the Writer, yes. where once again, you played a gay man, but a very different kind of gay man, a literary agent who relies on his work and his sense of humor to deflect mm -hmm. from his own internal struggles. What was yeah. the most challenging aspect of playing that role? Uh, well, you know, I had a great time. It was a, with Ron Canada and the lovely, lovely Marsha Cross from Desperate Housewives. So I just adore. You know, the whole the whole project. It was great. I had a great time doing it. We did it at the Signature Theater uh, in New York, but we had a very limited rehearsal time, and it was <laughs> our poor director fell off the stage on the first day of tech and broke, shattered her ankle, and horrible. I mean, and she was in a wheelchair on Percocet directing for the rest of the duration that had major, major surgeries. The big challenge with that was the the rewriting because we were have we were we did not have the luxury of a lot of rehearsal time and and the wonderful playwright Tony O'Dell was, you know, rewriting as we went. I mean, I think there was a scene that Marsha and I did that got rewritten eight times before it ever even saw an audience. And there were some little changes as we kept on going. But the challenge for me actually was I had like four or five big, huge monologues to the audience. And it was, you know, just at this age, the old memory. <laughs> but knock on wood, it, it went well. Well, I would imagine that playing Bruce Fisher gave you 
a greater appreciation for the happy 35-year relationship you've had with your husband, Tom. Yes, because Rustin didn't have that. Yeah, he did not. He was kind of scorned and and damaged by his relationships and a little a, a hint, a little bitter from it. But at the end, it's his heart is his heart is melted. Well, the play, Pay the Writer, raises some interesting questions about the intersection of race and homosexuality. And I was struck by something you said, Brian, in an interview when you were asked about that. You said, I don't want to get into anything political, but people just don't know how to behave and talk to each other anymore. The things that are passing for manners and decorum are fading. We need to keep our minds and hearts open to the new generation and what they're feeling. Brian, do you think theater is an important way to promote that kind of mutual respect and understanding that you were talking about? Oh, I think definitely, definitely. I was just in, of all places, Tahiti with um, on the Playbill cruise. Uh, I'm the luckiest man on the planet because they invite me and, and my husband Tom to go on these Playbill cruises with, you know, great Broadway stars that perform like Audrey McDonald and and, and Gavin Creel, and it's just amazing. And I, I get, to, I can sing a few songs now and then. I don't have to do a whole show. And I was in the pool and talking to some of the passengers. And this one lady said that she had this trans son. But the one thing she couldn't grasp, or the hardest thing, she she goes, "I'm fine with it. I understand." Blah blah blah. I always thought when I was pregnant that it was a boy, you know, but you know, genetically it was a girl, and blah blah blah. And she said, "The one thing I can't get." past is the, the gr gr grammar she goes i just i don't like being the, the whole thing of calling them they and i said well you know i was the same way initially but i, I listened to one of my godchildren and, and she's of this new generation and she said well you know uncle b it's like if you go to see the doctor and and and, and you ask a question someone asks questions you don't you say what did they say you don't say what did he say what did she say you don't you know if you don't know the gender or you just assume you say, what did they say? So that's that's how the they thing kind of made sense to me. And it's hard, you know. Uh, there's so many different things. And I, I I got in a discussion with someone once before, and they said, I just can't. I said, I said, is this like mini skirts and long hair in the 60s? Because you you're sounding like a grandpa. And it's not that, you know, we hold on to some things and we and sometimes, you know, when you get to be my age, it's you, you pass the torch, you pass. It to the next generation and you try to understand, you know, and have some kind of open communication. Otherwise, you're just going to be shut out. And I rather, I like inclusiveness. Well, I'm into that. Uh, now, speaking of promoting mutual understanding and respect, you starred in a beautiful short movie a few years ago called Raceland. Oh, wow. I had, a tiny, tiny, I had a tiny little part. Yeah, and that movie explores the dynamic between two presumably straight men who are grappling with the profound feelings they've had for each other over the years that they've had to suppress. Yeah, Was that one of your favorite movies that you've been in? Yeah, I had a good time. I'm, you know, it's, I've had, there's, so, there's so many little films that I've done that, you know, people never really, really got to see. A one I recently did I loved called Pinball, The Man That Saved the Game really enjoyed that. And and I love Raceland. I thought Raceland was all those same writers that wrote that have a great, great screenplay that I'm praying one day gets made called Southern Nights. And it's wonderful. And it it touches on the fire at the lounge upstairs, the tragedy here in New Orleans in the 70s that was really one of the mo most horrific LGBT hate crimes ever until part uh you know the, the one in, in the Pulse shootings. But this, it, it's a great, great story. Brings in gay Mardi Gras, but it, it, it has, it's a human story. And, the, and the, the, uh, the fire is just a catalyst, but it's really, really a great, great script. It's called Southern Nights. And I so hope it gets made. I really do. And there's one that's, that's now I'm, I'm in that, is hitting all the uh, film, uh, you know, the circuit for the festivals, and it's doing quite well and getting great notices. It's called High Tide, 
and it's really, really a beautiful film. The the creator of the film let me sent me a link to watch it, and I was like, wow, this is beautiful, and and I'm really hoping it does well because it's and I, once again I have a supporting part, but Marissa Tomei's in it, and Bill Irwin, and just a really great story. Well, you've been in so many great projects. You played the renowned costume designer, Ori Kelly, <laughs> in The Last of Robin Hood, which was about the last days of screen legend Errol Flynn. Mm-hmm. How do you prepare for a role when you're playing a real person? You know, I tried to find footage of him, and it was very difficult. And he had a hint of an Australian accent, but he really tried to get rid of it. So that was hard to do that. You know, when you're playing, you know, also in the movie Pinball, I played a real person, which there was no footage to find. He was actually the art director for GQ magazine in the mid 70s. And so I contacted a friend who was big in the modeling world, a little past that in the 80s. But some of the models those male models were still around and I he put me in contact with some of them and I got to at, talk to them and ask them what was he like so I was able to work on that to create the character but yeah it's you know you you, you draw and you try to be as accurate as possible but also when it's someone that people don't really know you can create even more you know because if there's no representation, you know, if you're playing someone that everyone has seen, you know, it's it's a different story. Oh, uh, for sure. You also appeared in Dolly Parton's Mountain Magic Christmas. Did you yeah. get to spend time with Dolly at all? You know, we filmed a couple of scenes together and she was just lovely, just wonderful and so giving and so kind. In fact, I broke my foot the second day of shooting. So if you look closely, I have this orange, big orange foot and one little orange foot because they, the costume designer put me in orange Airbird shoes. And then, but I, then I had to wear a boot for the rest of the filming. So they made a big orange sock to go over it. And the poor, there was a PA that had to push me around in a wheelchair. It was crazy. But Dolly was just so sweet. Like with the crowd scene, she would greet all the extras and you know take pictures with them and she also made sure they had a special chair for me because i had a broken foot so yeah she was she was heaven what a wonderful human being she is well you know from what i can tell brian you're one of a very select group of actors who has not been typecast you've demonstrated enormous versatility you've played doctors judges mayors clergymen straight men gay men You've done comedies, dramas, musicals, suspense thrillers, horror movies, family movies. How have you managed to avoid being typecast? I just try to say yes a lot. (laughs) You know, it's when it's offered. If I can do it, I do it. I I don't know. I've just been very, very lucky. One crazy movie I did was Spike Lee's Tales of the Hood 2. And it was, you know, a low-budget a sequel to his Tales of Tales of the Hood. Although I thought Spike Lee was going to be there, he wasn't. It was, <laughs> but it was one of these, you know, crazy, crazy. I'm, I'm in the second segment, there are three segments. And I remember when I was put myself on tape for that. And I'm, I, when I met the director, he just came up to me and he said, I just knew from your tape you were fearless. And I went, that's the biggest compliment. I, I've, I've received because I, I think I, I think I kind of am when it comes to theater and, and my work. Cause like, if you can do Starlight Express on roller skates, you kind of can kind of do almost anything. I think. Oh, that's for sure. You played in LBJ directed by Rob Reiner. What was he like to work with as a director? He was intense. He was great. He was, you know, like, let's go. And it was, it was a very, testosterone filled film you know but it was it was great we had a great time people everyone took that because of he was he was directing it and and some of the people we just had like one or two lines but everybody wanted to work with him do you have any desire to direct yourself no 
<laughs> Every actor says they want to direct. I'm like, no, I don't. I've done it. I've done a little bit. And it's, um, mm -mm. it's, uh, it's so much pressure. And I mean, I have ideas and I share them. And if, if the director, I think, you know, a smart director is open to, to uh, suggestion. You know, it's, it's always, I'm a, I'm of the school that the best idea in the room wins. It's, it's, but some people have, you know, big ego and they can't deal with someone else coming up with, you know, good ideas. But as far as being helming the entire thing, no, I think it's, it's very daunting for me. I like, I, I do like writing. I do like other forms of creation, but, uh, uh, you know, directing, I've, I've directed a couple of things in New York. And it was harrowing. And, and I'm not that organized. I'm very ADD. I, I, if I would, I'd have to have the best assistant ever who was just very organized. Well, I'd rather see you in front of the camera anyway instead of behind it. Mm -hmm. But now everyone knows you and your husband, Tom, have a magnificent home decor store called Hazelnut on Magazine Street in New Orleans, named after your grandmother, Hazel, correct? Hazel. Yes, her name was Hazel, and she was a nut. No, actually... Her, her, her maiden name was Nuss. And so the translation would be Hasselnuss, which is hazelnut. So, although well, she what, was, I mean, we're German, but it was like many generations past. You know what I love about your decision all those years ago to open your store, besides giving you and Tom the opportunity to create a business together, mm -hmm. is that it gives you a break from the rather myopic world of show business, don't you think? Exactly. It was one of the best decisions I ever made because you get to a certain point, especially in this business, and it, it, it can be all consuming. And it's an easy, easy trap to fall into, you know, because you, it's like, what are you working on next? You got to do what I got. And it's almost you define yourself by your work or what you're in or what shows you've done. Or, and a, a play that I was supposed to do uh, got canceled and I put all my eggs in that basket turned down other things. And we always had this idea in the back of our heads to do it. So I turned to Tom and I said, look, I have this time now. You've done the business plan. Let's do it. And literally, we called my sister-in-law. I was on the phone with my sister-in-law. I said, we're going to be looking for a spot. She was driving down the, like, the exact block we wanted to be on Magazine Street. She noticed a shoe store was closed in the middle of the day. She Literally, within a week, we had, we had a lease. We were it was so fast. And it was, it was, it was, the mo it was daunting as hell. It was scary. I'd wake up in cold sweats going, I don't know anything about theater. What am I doing? And thank God Tom had done this for years on Madison Avenue and raised up, as, you know, got up as high as he could until his bosses finally said, you have to do this on your own. You're too good at it. So together we did it. And it's, it's just been, it's, it's been 21 years and we never had a, a losing year. So I mean, even with the pandemic, we got through. And even with Katrina and, and all these other adversities. So knock on wood, it's, you know, it was, something's going right. Yeah, you've got a magnificent store. I've, I've enjoyed exploring the store's website, which for the benefit of our viewers is hazelnutneworleans.com. Brian, are you a believer that there are trends in home decor or do you feel that something beautiful will always be classic? Oh, there are trends, yes, but trends come and go. I mean, but if something is, it works and it's gorgeous and it's classic, it's going to be timeless. And I have several philosophies about design. I mean, not that I'm, you know, I don't have that shingle hanging up over my, over my door that I'm the interior designer, but I have worked as an interior designer for some people. But it is, if it looks right, it is right. And don't be afraid of color. What did it ever do to you? And there's some other ones, but it's like, you know, people are scared. You know, they think they can make, of making a mistake and, and picking, you know, and one thing when you get a new space is to inhabit it first and see how, move the furniture around. You'll, your body living in a space will show you the formation. I mean, there's only certain few ways you can put a couch and a, a bookcase and a, certain things in a room that's it, that's just there's only a few ways you can do it it's the hang of the art the color paint the walls you know and and different and see which color you like try the the test 
especially with the different lighting, you know, because at, at different times of day and different kind of lighting, you know, it will it will change and everything should be on a dimmer. Every light you have in the house should be on a dimmer. It's much cheaper than plastic surgery. Oh, I love that. Oh my God, I'm going to go out and buy a bunch of dimmers right now. <laughs> you co-wrote a home decor book with Katie Danos called Big Easy Style, Creating Rooms You Love to Live In. What inspired you to create that book? Oh. Well, honestly, I had been at, I got that book deal for She Ain't Heavy, She's My Mother. And literally, before I was going to go to New York to sign, you know, sign the contract, a young lady came into the store who was an editor with Random House and said the same, same, you know, book conglomerate. I love your shop. I love your aesthetic. If you would do a book about design, what would you do? And, you know, so I told her and she said, would you come pitch it? And I said, well, I'm going to be up in New York signing my contract. I'll sign the contract for the first book and then come down. And as I'm walking, you know, after I signed the contract to meet with the design book people, my book agent <laughs> basically said, now, look, be careful, you know, because you, you want to do this one first and then you give yourself some time. I said, oh, I can do it. Be careful what you wish for. So I went in and pitched my ideas. I said, great, we'll do it. And it, it, it almost did me in because it was a lot. It was a lot. Writing the book, she ain't heavy is one thing. But when you do a design book, you also have to provide all the photography. So staging, getting, scouting the houses, finding the ones I liked and want to be able to tell why, and then writing about it. And that that was a challenge. But, but we got through it. And thank God for Katie. You know, it was it was a, a Tom helped stage too. Tom is great at staging. And um, there was a lot of QTW. Quitting Time Wine. Well, I got to say, it's a really beautiful book. Again, it's called Big Easy Style, Creating Rooms You Love to Live In. It's a great gift to give anyone who would like a little help, a few ideas in decorating your home. Now, Brian, you co-wrote and starred in a one-man play called Dear Mr. Williams. Yes. About yes. the influence of Tennessee Williams on your coming of age and your becoming an actor. Are there any plans to take the show on tour or to bring it to New York? Well, yes, there are. And we're, it, it's, I never dreamed about how long it takes for these things to happen. Because one third of the, the play are, is Tennessee Williams words, that a state is involved and things aren't moving as fast as I would hope. However, they are on board. So... Keep, stay tuned, uh, because hopefully soon it will be off-Broadway. Oh, that's wonderful. Are there any other upcoming projects that you're free to tell us about? Um, besides High Tide, uh, that's coming out. And then um, later on this month, I'll be joining my friend Michael Cerverus and other uh, great New Orleans performers um, at, at Nine Lives at the Civic Theater here. On Monday, April 29th, it'll be a, a concert version. Nine Lives is a wonderful book by Dan Baum. And my friend Paul Sanchez musicalized it. And it's, it chronicles nine uh, New Orleanians' lives from 1965 when the devastating hurricane Betsy hit through 2005 when Katrina hit. And it's just very it's fascinating. It's all different kinds of genres of music and you know, Tony winner, two-time Tony winner, Michael Service will be in it. And me and Debbie, a bunch of people. And I also want to congratulate you. You're going to be the honoree at the New Orleans Film Society Gala, April the 13th. Congratulations, Brian. That's so well-deserved. I'm so flattered um, that they asked me. I thought, wow, who turned it down? <laughs> because, But I'm really thrilled. I'm thrilled. And you know, a bunch of my friends are coming. And so it, it's quite, quite wonderful. I'm very honored. Well, congratulations again. You know, it's been such a pleasure meeting you and having this chance to chat with you about your amazing life and career. I love this sense of serenity that you have. You don't project anxiety and worry about your career. You're enjoying your life. And I love that about oh. you. Thank you so much. You know, sometimes, you know, I have this, there's anxiety, you know, we all have that. 
But, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable with, I, there's some things I still want to do, but it ain't going to kill me if I don't. You know, it's what, you know, it's, I, I, my, my grandmother had this wonderful phrase. She said, just live your happy life. That's the best revenge. <laughs> Success is the best revenge. I can tell you that. Yeah, just live, just being happy. Just, and I, I'm a happy, happy guy. I'm very lucky. I, I think I was born happy. But, yeah. Well, I want to thank you for all the joy that you've brought your fans, all of the projects that you've been in on the stage and on the screen. It's been such a joy getting the chance to speak with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show, Brian. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Harvey. Thank you. Our guest has been the wonderful actor, author, and businessman, Brian Batt. All three of his books are available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. And don't forget to check out the website for his terrific home furnishings and gift store, Hazelnut. Just go to hazelnutneworleans.com. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.